how do you follow on from a panel on the Holocaust? Uh, I've certainly, I'm sure everyone here who was at the last panel is, is extremely shaken by what they've just heard and the incredible sensitivity with which both Roger and Jonathan dealt with it. I thought it was a, an amazing, an amazing panel. We have something slightly less uh, <laughs> depressing for you now, uh, 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 to lift the mood, I hope. Um, and this is one of our annual uh, events at Jaipur. We, from the very first year of the festival, we've always had the travel session uh, when uh, uh, travel writers or writers who have written about travel uh, read uh, from their work. Uh, and um, at the end, we'll have a, a discussion on, on, on the state of travel writing and where it stands today. But I think initially, just if we just go around the panel, I've asked them all to prepare a reading uh, of about five to seven minutes, uh, and then we can chat uh, after. So, Davina, do you want to kick off? Introduce, introduce your work, and, and if you want to, you, you've got your little seven minutes to do exactly what you wish with it. <laughs> so, my work is, um, I think it doesn't fall strictly into uh, travel writing or travelogue, but it is about... It's about me chasing six different harvests for um, around the country, um, writing about traditional fragrance. And the writing of it took me everywhere. And so I'm going to read out um, a passage from my travel to Kashmir, where I went looking for the saffron harvest. Sometimes I think about all the places that fragrance takes me to. Many of them are just in my wild imaginings, unknown places, familiar ones lost to time, huge landscapes, or just small nooks. I visit them all. Many other places are very much in the physical prosaic realm. The where I live is made up of a multitude of scents. To understand the rarest of them calls for travel to some of the further reaches of the country, which is how I found myself in Srinagar in November, in a season poised between a brilliant earth-toned autumn, still generous with sunshine and impressively blue skies, and a sullen winter with morose clouds, chilling wind and rain. I was chasing the saffron harvest, something I'd very nearly given up hope of seeing. Spice and by extension perfume have played a central role in the history of the subcontinent. India was routinely classified in Western medieval discourse as the most likely location for paradise, a source of exotic and valuable aromatic materials. In practical terms, those of long-distance trade, India was always rich in all the materials that made up the canon of ancient perfumery. Along with sandalwood, agarwood, and, agar and a few others, saffron was foremost as a marker of wealth, value, beauty, and more simply, pleasure. Within the country as well, there has long been a tradition of regional association with aromatics that were all well known and celebrated in much the same way as regional cuisine, ornaments, or styles of dress were. In a text dating around 900 BCE, a manual for poets, the author Raj Shekhar proposes a geographical classification of India along with the characteristics of each area, the cities within them, and the products from the area, including prominent fragrant materials, useful details for the benefit of poets who may, them, who may use them to more realistically describe a region. Beginning from the east, beyond Varanasi, he moves clockwise to the south, rich in sandalwood, to the west, from where comes Gugul, and finally to the north, which encompasses Saka, Han, Kamboj, and Turuska, and is known for cedar and saffron. The spice was so synonymous with its area of origin that in texts and formulas, it was interchangeably referred to simply as Kashmir or Kashmir Janma. Kashmir, to one who encounters it primarily via the national news, seems a forbidding place. Among the world's most heavily militarized zones, beautiful and hostile, Making a trip there involved a certain level of trepidation, much well-meaning advice from others about exercising caution and how best to navigate um, Srinagar with its distressingly high number of security checks. Happily, as my flight there was an early one, I was too sleepy to be nervous and on the whole too excited about this visit to care. At the Srinagar airport, arrival posed no hiccups, but just as I was wheeling my case toward the exit, a security guard stopped me. For a beat, I was worried, but as it happened, all she wanted to detain me for was not wearing a sweater. Don't just hold on to it, put it on, you're in Kashmir now, she admonished. And I complied sheepishly before carrying on, well clad out of the terminal into a clear, bright day. Army personnel, sandbag barriers, guns, and barbed wire 
were all still an inescapable and sobering part of the landscape. But even so, all that drab olive and khaki was overshadowed by the fall foliage putting on its annual display. The chinar trees synonymous with Kashmir were especially beautiful. Tall and graceful, their flourishing canopies alive with red, gold, and saffron leaves, they left me slack-jawed. Doubtless, I am Gosh, a city girl for whom natural beauty is usually seen corralled in parks. In Kashmir, as it casually asserted itself at every turn, paying no heed to less appealing man-made structures around it, I was in a state of constant awe, trying to take it all in. The vast blue skies and crisp air, the peaceful lake, the many bridges over the city's waterways, and the unique views so different from those of any city I've been to. It was a while before I finally arrived at the family-run guest house, complete with creaky wooden floors and Bukhari heaters, where I was to be staying for the week. I'll stop there. Thank Lovely. you. Lovely. Thank you. Yuvan. I'll be reading from my uh, book, Intertidal, uh, which is a sort of diary of deep observation of coast, Waterscapes, landscapes. If I could interrupt, the most gorgeous, gorgeous book. You must all go out and buy it straight away. <laughs> and um, I, I feel a bit like an imposter sitting, with, sitting in a travel writing session. I tend to travel vastly, sometimes by not moving at all. Um, I'll, I'll read a passage where uh, I'm doing some traveling. And this, this uh, entry is about ficuses, you know, the banyan people, bat fig, uh, the cluster fig. You know, all of which have deep roots of uh, sacrality as well as all kinds of other cultural, mythical, poetical, poetic, uh, you know, roots and veins in India. Um, yeah, so this starts off with the great banyan, which is, uh, you know, some people say it's the oldest banyan uh, in India and it's found in the Theosophical Society in Chennai. And, and I go on to speak of ficuses and and the ways in which they make landscapes. And, uh, and I'm trying to understand the landscape through the, the world making of ficus. So, I visited the great, ba great Adyar Banyan again last week. My nature educator colleagues and I had taken children from Urur Kuppam and Ramapuram on a walk inside the Theosophical Society, learning how to read clues and tracks on the sand, the trees and through the soundscape. The children loved playing with the utter hydrophobicity of lily pads in the pond near the tree, which means basically you put drops there, it doesn't stick, it sort of rolls off. Your kids love that. And yeah. We listened to the afternoon's calls, the flameback woodpecker tree pie, squirrels alarm at every passerby as the day touched 40 degrees. Not next to the great banyan though, this being which had been alive for over half a millennium. When the nosy Portuguese sailor Vasco da Gama reached India, this tree was a seedling girdling a palmyra or a neem. Five centuries later, its prop root web is now wide as a village, its phylosphere large as a monsoon cloud. During a storm in 1989, its main trunk collapsed. But the tree lives on, anchored by its aerial roots, each like a small tree trunk. A banyan is known to walk around with them, its strides stretched over decades, dropping roots towards where it wants to move and withdrawing them in other places. This one is possibly related to mother of, great, great grandparent of almost every other banyan in Chennai. In front of this tree is a trilithon, a stone gate known to be over 2000 years old, placed here like a portal by Colonel Alcott one of the Theosophical Society's founders. The last time I visited this tree was three years ago, before uh, COVID-19. I had come to it for consolation three days after my sister died and spent some time under it. I could cry to it safely, a grief I had not poured anywhere, anywhere else. Banyans enter my dreams easily without asking. Their roots and folds and chaotic connections are too nerve-like, thought-like, dream-like. They reach into the mind which sees itself as it sees into canopy. That night I walked on my street, my home and uh, this is a dream by the way, yeah. That night I walked on my street, my home and other apartments gone, banyans in their place, grass overgrown, a playground sinking into wood, hawk eagles overhead with wingspans too large. Then a mongoose 
cross my dream path from right to left saw me face to face then trotted along friendships formed across species allowed leaps in life's evolution showed lin margulis among my favorite evolutionary biologists friendship between eukaryotic cells and bacterial cells created the animal cell with mitochondria and plant cell with chloroplasts friendship between plant and fungi entirely changed the atmosphere's composition friendship between polyp and zooxanthellae in the seas making coral reefs then between flowering plants and bees and so on symbiogenesis she called it i saw another symbiogenesis remaking the world right now around me silently transfiguring the human made world brick by brick every day in the morning i sat on the balcony and watched for a while the people sapling growing from the railway station's pillar and the 3 foot banyan on its sunshade later i walked into the unoccupied spaces of the station towers and noticed ficus roots cracking the withering cement under the station's terrace running alongside the rusting steel bars some ficuses like banyan people and bat fig will never germinate on the ground coil oriole mina and other birds must eat their fruits and leave their cd droppings on another tree then that ficus grows like an arboreal octopus into the host tree trunk sucking out their health growing down rooting into ground buildings two whole nutrients brick lime and sand which the ficus has learned to tap a wet mossy patch on a roof or sunshade is ideal or just a vertical wall steve cuts in his film man shows a dark post human landscape of cement and skyscraper wetlands lifeless and uninhabitable upon which a lone white man sets his throne It's a powerful image but it may be wrong a post human world may well be a dense ficus forest forged from brick and concrete planted by frugivorous birds full of life and people included I have a minute more yes. oh, okay on the weekend uh, rohit my friend and i go around old madras to see the slow insurgence of ficus trees given 50 years in their space they will climb over our monuments and dismantle them they see no need for old british forts in the city might as well turn them into trees ficus roots are breaking open prison chambers and the armories at fort st george cracking the corners climbing out of its warm moats old bungalows of merchants and zamindars in washam and petta already four story forests people pours out roars out of french windows its roots run like and into plumbing the central presses old colonial buildings also run over invading banyans have been chopped off multiple times but they have grown through the floors like veins such that a new building has been built for the press to function parakeets and mynas fly out of the branches inside the indo saracenic balconies tailor bird and ashi prinia call from inside a warehouse the apex towers of the high court host ficus seedlings one tree has knocked down the wall of an amman temple built around it and the place is enclosed in green sheets for renovations abandoned agraharams of north north of nsc bos road have huge bat fig and banyan breaking out of their tiled roofs temples churches mosques any religion can be turned into bark leaves heartwood and sapwood sam miller uh thank you um I'm going to read a bit from my latest book which is called uh, Migrants the Story of Us All which really argues that we are fundamentally a migratory species and that we used to recognize that on the whole but that we don't anymore. Uh I too am a bit of an imposter. It's not really a travel book. Um and it was my plans for travel were curtailed slightly by various lockdowns. Uh I did however make it to a small town in southwest England called Totnes. And Totnes has an unlikely connection with the founding of Rome, which I will now explain. Um Rome as you know, according to Virgil, was founded by Aeneas, Aeneas of Troy. Um and the notion that cities and countries 
were founded by Trojans was very popular in Europe until relatively recently. Um, Virgil set out that another Trojan founded, called Antenor, uh, founded uh, Padua, uh, and you can find a supposed tomb, actually a much, from a much later period of Antenor, in the main square. Um, France emerged as a would-be, as would, the French emerged as would-be Trojans from the seventh century onwards. Uh, others soon followed sort. Um, particularly the rulers of several smaller North European principalities. Uh, Hainault, Brabant, Burgundy, Geneva, all of them claimed Trojan ancestry for their founders. The British, too, <coughs> claimed Trojan heritage and actually clung on to the story longest. And it even reappeared like the ghost of a ghost during the Brexit debate. The British version is more elaborate than most of the fantasies about Trojan ancestry and first appeared in the 9th century History of Britain compiled by a Welsh monk called Nennius who explained that Britain was named after Brutus, a hitherto unknown grandson of Aeneas. It needs to be explained that he's thought to have come up with that explanation because a, a, a more famous um, scholar of the late ancient period, St. Isidore of Seville, claimed that the Britons were so named because they were brutes. The story of Brutus, rather than the brutes, it was one that would swell and grow until by the 12th century, it would become the first part of an epic retelling of British history by the cleric Geoffrey of Monmouth a fantastical story that starts with the life of Brutus and moves on to King Lear, Cymbeline, King Arthur, and the arrival of the Anglo-Saxons. Uh, in that version, Tro uh, Brutus turns up in Britain with a few Trojan friends, uh, kill the only inhabitants who were giants, and settle the island. Um, Brutus's children inherit parts of the kingdom which roughly correspond to England, Scotland, and Wales. There would be many versions of this story, all based ultimately on Geoffrey. Most of them were keen to pick up on the notion that Britain was uninhabited, apart from giants, before Brutus turned up. And it was used as a way of reclaiming a British identity that predated later migrants, the Romans, the Anglo-Saxons, and the Normans. It's a story that Spencer wrote about, Milton wrote a poem about, Pope began writing a Brutiad, and William Blake, who famously wondered if Jesus had ever visited England, was also taken with the story of Brutus and Troy and contributed a distinctly romantic vision of Britain's origins in his poems, O Sons of Trojan Brutus. It's a story that's largely been forgotten now. The myth of Brutus and the story of Tro the Trojan ancestors of the British people has been largely ignored or forgotten. But there is one small part of this story that lives on, but only just, and it relates to the place where Brutus is said to have landed. Geoffrey of Monmouth is quite clear. With the wind behind him, he sought the promised island and came ashore at Totnes. And so is a far more modern couplet supposedly spoken by Brutus. Now here I sit and here I rest, and this town shall be called Totnes. The town of Totnes, population 8,000, is in southwest England and is not actually on the sea, but eight miles upstream. The river on which it stands is navigable, so it's just possible that some ancient boats did make their way up the river. Totnes sits on a hill beside the river, and halfway up that hill, on the high street, there's an inconspicuous stone embedded in the pavement, marking the spot where Brutus is said to have landed. There's a sign painted on the wall pointing out the Brutus stone, but I'd have missed both the sign and the wall altogether if I hadn't looked behind a dustbin. A friend who has spent all his life in Totnes did not know of its existence. 
And it's hard to avoid the conclusion that Bru the Brutus Stone is a strong contender as Britain's least impressive visitor attraction. Totnes was once proud of its Trojan connection, but now Brutus has been all but forgotten. Today, the town enjoys a more modern reputation in the, as a counterculture sorry, as a counterculture capital of the Southwest, with drop-in meditation, new moon manifesting ceremonies, and yoni love workshops advertised on bills around the a town. Totnes, they like to say, is twinned with Narnia. But Totnes has been back in the news. Jonathan Cooper, a local lawyer and opponent of Brexit, declared Totnes an independent city-state, which, unlike the rest of the United Kingdom, would stay in the U European Union. He stood in the street, handing out Totnes passports to any passers-by who would swear an oath to the European Union. There was a special passport for pets, too, with the hashtag, poo to Brexit. <laughs> the Totnes passport helped return Brutus to the story of Britain. For on the inside pages of each passport, more than a thousand were issued, was an image of a bearded warrior with a fabulously ornate helmet and printed in faux Latin script next to the warrior was the single word Brutus. Cooper's claim of independence was based, you see, on the argument that because Totnes was surrounded, because Totnes was founded by Brutus of Troy, the people of Totnes are in fact residents of Troy and can therefore break away from the United Kingdom and remain part of the EU. All nonsense, of course, but mischievously subversive, and it brought lots of publicity to Totnes and to Brutus of Troy, the legendary founder of Britain. Thank you. Nick. I feel I'm the fourth imposter. Uh, 25 years ago, I published a biography of the travel writer Bruce Chatwin. And it had taken me seven years traveling in his footsteps all over the world, which is roughly the length of time that the British sent their criminals to Australia for transportation. And I wanted to recover my, myself. I wanted to find a Chatwin-free zone in order to recuperate. And the two places I could find where he had never been were Baffin Island, which I didn't really want to go to, and Tasmania, about which I knew nothing. So I went in exactly this time to Tasmania in 1999. I was attracted by uh, an earlier traveler who would said that Tasmania is as far away from England as you can get, and if you travel any further, you're on your way home again. Just before I left, my grandmother, hearing that I was going to what had once been called Van Diemen's Land, said, oh, I think we had a black sheep in the family who went there. And she produced a, a, a plastic bag of letters, like the color of kind of dirty fingernails, going back 200 years from this black sheep, who was a man called Anthony Fenn Kemp. Robert Hughes described him as a malevolent malcontent who had been sent, as I discovered later, from Sydney to claim Van Diemen's Land for the British. Um, I was going to read a, a, a short passage about Tasmania, which is often mistaken for Tanzania. <laughs> Separated from the Australian mainland by 140 miles of the treacherous pitch and toss of Bass Strait, Tasmania is a byword for remoteness. As with Patagonia, to which in geological prehistory it was attached, it is like outer space on Earth and invoked by those at the so-called center to stand for all that is far-flung, strange, and unverifiable. Tasmania is in myth and in history a secret place, a rarely visited place. Those few who did make the journey compared it to Elysium or sometimes to Hades. 
For the first 50 years of its settlement, it was, with the notorious Norfolk Island, Britain's most distant penal colony, and under the name of Van Diemen's Land, was open panopticon for 70,000 convicts gathered from many pockets of the empire, the majority of them thieves. The average sentence for the transportees was seven years to a destination that was described by English judges as beyond the seas and might take eight months to reach. They call it the end of the world, was one convict's verdict. And for vice, it is truly so. For here, wickedness flourishes unchecked. Reports and fables of depravity and cannibalism, sometimes made of Van Diemen's land, a synonym for all kinds of terror and dread. But after 1856, under the new name of Tasmania, the island, which is the size of Ireland, Sri Lanka, or West Virginia, became popular as a health resort. Its exceptional natural beauty, fertile soil, and temperate climate attracted immigrants who were sick of English weather and yet wanted to be reminded of, of home. The extinction of the original native Aboriginal population by 1876 further bolstered the illusion of a society that Anthony Trollope, dropping in on the way to visit his Jackaroo son, described as more English than is England herself. Because it was so far away, it did its best to be very near. First sighted by a European in 1642, when the Dutch navigator Abel Tasman mistook it for the mainland of Australia, Tasmania was not colonized by the British until the first years of the 19th century. It's a place that the Hollywood actress Merle Oberon was persuaded to claim as her birthplace, in which Errol Flynn and Viscount Montgomery of Alamein grew up, and into which all manner of felons and explorers and adventurous sorts disappeared, of whom perhaps the most interesting was a turbulent British officer called Anthony Fenn Kemp, and among the most recent, perhaps, the fugitive Lord Lucan, a place where not even Iran's fundamentalist police would dream of looking for you. In an essay that Salman Rushdie wrote after the fatwa, he quoted a joke that was circulating, what's blonde with big tits and lives in Tasmania? Answer, Salman Rushdie. <laughs> Until 9,000 years ago, Tasmania was connected to the Australian mainland, but at the end of the last ice age, melt from the glaciers swamped the land bridge, on the other side halting species such as the dingo and koala at the water's edge. Tasmania became an ark, and with one or two exceptions, a very extraordinary animal and plant life was left to develop. The world's oldest living organism, King's Holly, or Lamartia tasmanica, has grown on the south coast without interruption for 40,000 years. Van Diemen's Land's most notable historian, the Victorian clergyman John West, would by and large still recognize the park-like lands, the brilliant skies, the pure river, and the untainted breath of morning. The roads are superbly deserted, but at night they teem with strange nocturnal creatures, wombats, wallabies, quolls, Tasmanian devils, and the ubiquitous possum, plus three varieties of snake that are all lethal. In the fierce light of the Tasmanian day, the emptiness of the landscape can sting with a melancholy that is unbearable. You never forget that the enchanted isle is also a haunted one, the last habitat of the Tasmanian tiger as well as of the Tasmanian Aborigines, who knew it as Trawena. Innumerable lakes throw back the doubles of huge eucalypts with a brilliance that can make their reflections appear even more solid than the trees themselves. The upheld arms of dead white ghost gums stand in for a vanished population, and the shrieks of yellow-tailed black cockatoos are said to be the lament of dead Aboriginal children. They had gone, writes the Tasmanian author Martin Flanagan, in the way that party guests are said to have gone and left a house feeling oddly empty. What you notice about the landscape is that despite the desecration caused by overlogging, it is free from pollution. The roaring 40s, after blowing unimpeded from Cape Horn, smack at full tilt into the west coast. The result, Tasmania has the purest air in the world, as well as some of its cleanest rainwater. Much of the island's western half remains a protected wilderness of mountains, impenetrable rainforest, and torrential rivers. A sailor told a newcomer who arrived a century ago, in half that wilderness, no man has put foot since time began. 
The bulk of the population of just under half a million live in the southern capital Hobart and in Launceston in the north. Between these rival cities, the central plateau, which the Tasmanians call Tears, are dotted with Georgian-style houses and churches set amid orchards and open farmland. The East Coast is fringed... Sorry. The East Coast is fringed... Sorry. The East Coast is fringed with bright white beaches and small inlets and has a Caribbean aspect. It is not the ruined coastline of most countries, and it would probably have looked much the same on the blustery November morning in 1804 when Anthony Fen Kemp floundered out of the water under the bemused eye of the native population. Colin. Thank you. I've got any time left. Well, being incompetent with technology and email, I've only just heard that I'm meant to be reading to you. Uh, but uh, somebody has kindly lent me their copy of my book. Um, <laughs> so I will start with that. Thank you. Um, the virtue of this passage is that it's going to be very short since we only have 10 minutes left. And I think Willie is going to read from one of yours too. Um, this is a book from, um, called To a Mountain in Tibet, which I wrote about eight years ago after the death of the last of my family. Um, I think that um, I went to Mount Kailash, of which many of you will be familiar. It rises separate from the main Himalaya, almost like an object of worship in itself um, in Tibet. It is an object of worship for Hindus um, and for Buddhists and Jain too. And I went, I think, in the spirit of um, wanting to leave a gap between my ordinary life. I didn't want it just to continue as it, as it had, um, just to create a kind of hiatus, not perhaps in the spirit of looking for God, but for um, looking for some kind of peace and reconciliation. So this um, very short um, account is of my walking up the Kanali Valley in western Nepal towards the Tibetan border of Kailash. The sun is rising to its zenith. Silver gray boulders lie tumbled along the track among mattresses of thorns and smoke blue flowers. The storm clouds that hang on the further mountain do not move. There's no sound but the scrunch of our boots and the clink of the Sherpa's trekking pole. And underfoot, the stones glisten with quartz. These first hours have a raw exhilaration. The track shimmers ahead with a hard brilliance. The earth is young again. Perhaps it is the altitude that brings this lightness and anticipation. Within an hour, we have flown from near sea level to over 8,000 feet, and I feel weightless, as if my steps will leave no trace. Beneath us, the little town of Simicot hangs above an abyss, an abyss of empty valleys. Its corrugated iron roofs flash among patches of green barley. It is slipping behind us. From its runway of patched earth, the twin otter aircraft that carried us in has already turned away and flown between the mountains. There are no roads here. Humla is the remotest region in Nepal, little visited by trekkers even now. The nearest paved highway, the lowland route from Kathmandu to Delhi, lies hundreds of mountain miles to the south. And to the east, the climbers' load stars, Galagiri, Annapurna, Everest, are all out of sight. As we walk, a dark forested gully opens to the west, carving a giant corridor through the mountains. Its walls rise in vertiginous foothills towards 15,000 foot summits, gashed with snow and clouds. Noiselessly, far below us, through the immense gulf so steep as often to lie out of sight, 
The Kanari River is raging coldly down from the highest source of the Ganges. It is nowhere navigable, but for the next 10 days, it will steer us northwards. It twists ahead with a chill magnetism, mounting by icy steps higher and deeper through the western Himalaya for 100 miles before us into Tibet. Thank you. Wonderful. I'm just going to write a very, read a very short passage from Nine Lives um, to allow some time for questions. But this is set in um, one of the great Sufi shrines of Sindh, which are currently under threat from, from Wahhabi uh, Muslims who dislike the, uh, the heterodoxy of, of Sufism and its openness to other religions, notably Hinduism. Uh, and I was uh, visiting the, um, the shrine of Shah Abdul Latif and talking to the Sufis there. We talked all morning about the Sufism of Sindh and Sain Fakir's belief that it would never succumb to the Wahhabis. One of Sain Fakir's sons brought green tea and we sat in the shade beside a bubbling rill of spring water as the midday sun beat down sipping tea and tearing great flaps of newly cooked naan. Every so often, father and son would burst into song, illustrating some theological point with a verse or two of Shah Abdul Latif's Risalo. You must understand, said Sain Fakir, putting his hand on his heart. Everything is inside. That is what we believe. Both hell and paradise. It is all within you. So few understand this. There is a story about Lal Shabazz Kalanda, which Sain once taught me, said Lal Peri. One day Lal Shabazz was wandering in the desert with his friend, Sheikh Bahauddin Zakaria. It was winter and evening time. And so they began to build a fire to keep warm. They found some wood, but then they realized that they had no matches. So, so Sheikh Bahauddin suggested to Lal Shabazz that he turn himself into a falcon, which was one of the things that Lal Shabazz Galanda could do, uh, and get fire from hell. Off he flew. But an hour later, he came back empty-handed. There is no fire in hell, he reported. Everyone who goes there brings their own fire and their own pain from this world. Thank you. <laughs> to open the questions, Colin, I remember a decade ago or more, you wrote a wonderful piece in the Times Literary Supplement defending travel writing, which in some post-colonial and post-modern circles have been attacked as a sort of form of, 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 sort of, po of colonialism, as, 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 as white elite males, which there are very few on this panel, uh, going off and, uh, uh, and, and looking at the natives in inverted commas and reporting back. And you wrote a very impassioned response uh, saying that travel writing at its best was an act of empathy. Would you like to just talk a little about, about why you think travel writing is still uh, a, a wonderful literary form and, uh, and, and a form of humanism. Yes, I think travel writing has been under attack, um, certainly in the West, for some 20 years, uh, ever since um, beginning, I think, as so many things begin, in American academia. Um, a woman called Mary Louise Pratt um, started it, I think, almost um, Edward Said's Orientalism, an idea that um, the, particularly the single white male who is carrying the legacy of empire with him um, uh, should not be traveling among, I I in poorer countries than his own. And this has become um, a, a, a sort of haunting ghost um, for many traditional travel writers. I think it's based on um, the ideas of Michel Foucault, um, who wrote continually about power, who has the power, 
um, the travel writer um, White um, coming from a, probably a wealthier country than the one he's traveling in. Um, he is the one who has the knowledge, perhaps the education, and certainly the money um, to be, um, if you like, exploiting the people amongst whom he's journeying. Um, I think this is, um, uh, there's some truth in this. Um, as a, a white male, particularly from Britain, carrying this great legacy of colonialism, um, you cannot but feel it. At the same time, if you travel with a feeling that maybe the country you're going to will actually have something to teach you, you travel in a, in a spirit of some sort of understanding, it becomes rather different. And if we go always with an idea of power, who has the power, who doesn't, um, then all our relationships, even between one and another, are unequal, and all human contact descends into a kind of paranoia. Thank you. Yuvan, do you want to <coughs> respond to that? Because um, I know that, I'm just, just listening to you reading just then, there are definite echoes of, of our mutual friend Rob McFarlane and, 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 the, old, and the wild places um, in, in what you were reading. And I, I, how do you, coming from here, look on that tradition of... of, of okay, I know you don't think of yourself as a travel writer, but you do do what travel writers do. You have a notebook, you go out, you observe, you turn it into beautiful prose. Talk a little about your process and, and how you regard that tradition. Um, um, Colin's response uh, resonates uh, quite, quite uh, strongly with me. And um, to briefly respond to that, in my head... I have uh, learned to make a distinction between inhabitation and exhabitation, drawn from the anthropologist Tim Ingold. So, is because within locals there can be power hierarchies, and when you when you're into activism and other things, you find that that sometimes is more destructive than any you know so-called foreign influence. So, is somebody's identity, uh, se selfhood, in, in place there? You know, with you know, or is there purely an extractive relationship? A local can have an extractive relationship by means, say, of trawling in the ocean versus, uh, you know, somebody else can see uh, a sacrality in the ocean. So, I've, I've sort of moved away from local, non-local to inhabitation and exhabitation, which is a more complex idea. And exhabitation meaning what? M meaning I've come to a place with an agenda and a purpose and I take it and I leave it. Thank you very much. We, despite the, uh, the buzzer, uh, we have time for just one or two very quick questions if anyone wants to ask anything of the panel. Lady here on the... Uh, over here in white. Yeah. Hi. I'm not sure it's a quick question um, because I'm now confused about what, what is travel writing. I kind of came trying to be inspired about writing, you know, travel writing, and now I'm really confused because almost everyone said that they didn't do it. <laughs> so I would love to just hear some... I, I would argue that travel writing's strength is that it has this porousness, that it is a cornucopia into which you can put whichever treasures you happen to be interested in. If you're a naturalist like Yvonne, uh, you can record about the wonderful creatures in, the, in between the, the high tide and the low tide. If you're like Sam, and, uh, a, a, a cosmopolitan traveling the world, you can look in search of migrants. Uh, if you are uh, like uh, Nicholas trying to get away from Bruce Chatwin, you can uh, uh, go to Tasmania uh, and so on, or, or with Davina with her love of, of, of perfume. Davina, do you want to reply to that? To your question um, as to what travel writing is, I mean, I, I think William is right here. It can be, you know, it, it's made its way into all of our writings, and so it's um, quite amorphous in that in that sense. Um, for me uh, personally, I would say that the value of travel travel writing is the um, is the observations that it brings that that um, that I would not have had otherwise, and. Um, Mostly, I think, to, to recast a familiar place. And I think um, to that, I will mention, William, your first book on Delhi, Sam's book on Delhi, um, and Yuvan's work, which is, you know, where he says he doesn't move at all, but you re-look at, at a place that you have seen before very differently once you read a travel writer's perspective on it or their observations. 
Um, a, a few weeks ago, I went to see my father, who is 93 and who was born in India. And I was talking about the, po the poem by Kavafi, Ithaca, and he hadn't heard of it. And so I, I read it out to him. And I'm sure you all know this famous poem about Ithaca. If, if uh, not, if, Google it, because it's Google wonderful. It. It's about the destination that you will reach after a very long journey, presumably your life. And it's about all the adventures you'll meet on the way, the pirates will try and rock, uh, uh, assault your boat, the storms will, will batter it, and the bays and the islands and the things that you'll meet on your way, the experiences you'll have. And the poem is about actually Ithaca, when you finally get there, is probably a scrappy little settlement. And the great thing about Ithaca is it was all the adventures you had on your way. And it struck me that when I ever I talked to Bruce Chatwin, who's also a friend of Collins and Willie's, that he said the important thing is a quest. You've got to have a quest. So for him, it was going down, parodying Jason and the Argonauts searching for the Golden Fleece and finding at the other end of the earth, at the bottom of Patagonia, in Last Hope Sound, in a cave, a scrap of giant sloth skin as a kind of parody of the Golden Fleece. But on that journey to it, he had, he had hung all these other stories of encounters in history and people that became a classic book in, in Patagonia. And I think um, with Bruce, it was, he didn't know if he was running away from something or running towards it, the old Montaigne dichotomy. And I think Colin and I were talking that we would never dream of writing a travel book about England. We are motivated by getting away, as far away from England as possible and immersing ourselves in other cultures. Not even Totnes? Um, not even Totnes. But I, I think the quest is all important. Uh, people travel for many, many reasons. But I think for me, the quest and what happens on the journey becomes, in a sense, the quest itself. We're out of time now, but I think we're all going to be signing our books at the little book tent. So anyone wants to ask us anything then, can welcome to bring your question over there uh, and buy a book. Thank you.